by Interact. So some of you may not have been on a webinar been able to ch uh, know how to look for a chat box. So this screen here is just to help you know how to interact because we like to hear what you're thinking, get some of your thoughts or information. And so down here you can see that it says type question here. On the right hand side you can type your comments and questions throughout the webinar and I'll be taking a look at those and we are going to do our best to answer all of your questions. At the end you'll have an opportunity to raise your hand and ask some more questions that may not have gotten answered. And so there is a box on the right hand side with a picture of a hand on it. And if you click on that, then we know that you have a question that you'd like to ask at the end. Some of you may be logging on from a web-based interface. And if your screen looks like this on the right hand side, this is where you'll find your chat box. This is where you'll also find your ability to raise your hand. So, I wanted to let everyone know that we are uh, Vision Quest 2020 and we're the ones that do the training for iSpy 2020 and I'll tell you a little more information about us in a moment. But uh, for you to stay connected with us, you can take a look at us on, like us on Facebook. You can get more information about iSpy 2020 at iSpy2020.com. And also on Twitter, if you use the hashtag iSpy2020 with no slash in the middle, you can uh, tweet out questions and keep in touch with other people who have been on the webinar. We have many videos, training materials on YouTube as well, and you can take a look at our social media page on there as well. And we have everyone muted out, but if you are just joining us from a call in line, go ahead and mute your phone out if you haven't had the opportunity to do so already. Okay, so Vision Quest 2020, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we're based out of Phoenix, Arizona. We're dedicated to the early detection of vision disorders and preventable blindness in children. Vision Quest 2020 was started by Dr. James O'Neill and Richard Terendi. And Dr. O'Neill would see countless children suffer from vision loss in his office every week. He would see these children and their families and have to tell them that, unfortunately, their child has permanent vision loss that could have been prevented had they had an accurate vision screening. So this is what was the catalyst for Dr. O'Neill and um, technology developer Richard Terendi to create iSpy 2020 and it's the video game vision screeners. Together they found a Vision Quest 2020 and they're using this technology to solve a public health issue. And we created an innovative vision screening model making it accurate and affordable for all children. And our tagline is because every child deserves to see. So today, um, I'd like to introduce to you our presenter, and our presenter is Richard Terendi, and he is one of the founders of Vision Quest 2020 and the technology developer of Vision Screen's video game, iSpy 2020. Thank you for joining us, and I'm going to hand it over to Richard. Great, thank you. Uh, Monica, are you able to hear me okay? I can hear you, yes. Okay, I, there's just there's some background noise. I'm not sure where it's coming from, so I didn't know if that was me or not. So thank you for uh, moderating this, and it's absolutely my pleasure to be talking about iSpy 2020. I am an electrical and computer engineer by degree, and I've had the good fortune of working in various industries where I had the privilege of patenting, inventing and patenting technology. And about 15 years ago, I had the honor of uh, speaking with Dr. O'Neill and hearing his frustration with um, children losing their vision unnecessarily. And I honestly, I didn't understand uh, exactly what he was talking about at the time. It, it was completely unbeknownst to me that 
there are certain vision disorders that are very hard to detect in children. And in fact, if they go undetected and thus untreated, children can end up losing their vision in one eye. I had experienced uh, temporary yet total blindness as a very young child. And uh, when I had this conversation with Dr. O'Neill, it, it really struck me that there had to be a better way. And so I stopped everything that I was doing and joined forces with Dr. O'Neill to make his dream a reality. And that was to develop a revolutionary approach to detecting vision disorders in children. So that's what I want to share with you today. And I, uh, in case I forget, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to, to learn more about Eyes by 2020. I know that some of you are considering Eyes by 2020 uh, for your schools, and I also know that perhaps some of you are going to be implementing the program in the very near future and want to learn more about the, the technology. So, um, you know, this vision screening technology is truly state-of-the-art. It is a fully automated vision screening technology and database. So we're going to talk about both of those things today. And what you will see um, is that it really provides unprecedented accuracy, but also insight to your data that previously was not available. So um, along the way, if you have any questions, as Monica already pointed out, please raise your hand or type, uh, type them into the chat box so that uh, we make sure that we, we answer your questions in real time if that's possible. So who is this training for? Well, if you're a vision screener and you're looking for an easy and accurate way without being uh, a specialized individual, some vision screeners in, you know, in various states require that they go through a lengthy certification process. They have to be recertified. One of the advantages to iSpy is that you don't need to be certified in order to perform vision screenings using iSpy. Of course, school nurses uh, have uh, an interest and a need for, for iSpy as well to make sure that the students that they're responsible for can actually see the blackboard. And administrators of, of individuals as well that might be looking at um, the data, actually, and uh, need a platform that automatically collects the data and, and provides them analysis tools or easy to use customization. So we're going to talk about all of these uh, aspects of ice by 2020 today. So what we would like to do very briefly is have you, if you wouldn't mind just taking a couple, I, I think maybe one minute, and just uh, let us know who you are, uh, what is your role in vision screening or with your organization? And there should be a poll that popped up on the screen, at least I hope so. This will just help us understand so maybe we can um, uh, tailor the presentation a little bit more appropriately, but we want to make sure that we capture And I thank you for filling this out. We're almost done with, I think, everyone letting us know who they are. We've got a little bit more time left. We have a few more that we're waiting for her to respond. Yeah, it looks like right now the, the majority of people are either, you know, nurse and health assistants or they're actually uh, volunteering or performing the vision screening. So that's very helpful. And what I'll do is I'll keep that poll open for a little bit longer, but I'm going to move on in the presentation. So, you know, here's what you may or may not be thinking is, is you know, why, do, why is it important to vision screen? And in fact, why should we be changing how we vision screen? 
And so there's a, a just a wealth of information around this. I'm going to close the poll now. Um, there's an awful lot of information uh, out there with regards to vision. But what I would like to do is share with you just a couple things real briefly. One is that, and I, again, was completely unaware of this, but up to one in four school-age children have a vision problem. Now, what's interesting about this is that children often don't know that they have a vision problem. Many of you are probably aware of this. You see, you, perhaps you see, you see this all the time. But, you know, if a child's world has always been blurry, they don't know any different. They don't know that they're supposed to be able to see airplanes and leaves on a tree. And they don't know that they're supposed to be able to see the blackboard. So vision disorders are unfortunately very common. And quite unfortunately, according to the Healthy People uh, 2010 Progress Review Report, they found that there has been absolutely no progress made in the early detection of vision disorders and thusly no reduction in preventable blindness in children under the age of 17. This is heartbreaking because it is such a solvable issue. Um, the good news is that if you detect a child with vision problems, treatment is typically very easy. Uh, it's typically corrective lenses. Now, of course, there are cases where you have to do sur you know, surgery on a child if they've got a droopy eyelid or crossed eyes or something, you know, cataract that needs to be removed. But the vast majority of vision problems that we're talking about are very easily treated. And yet, despite that, there's been no progress made in early detection. Well, as Monica pointed out early, earlier, part of the reason for that is that we're using a technology that's over 150 years old. If you're using an eye chart, there is a very well-established protocol or set of rules that need to be performed exactly the same way each and every time in order to get an accurate result. And this requires an extensive amount of training, a lot of knowledge. It's got to be committed to memory, and it needs to be done flawlessly. And that is just, quite honestly, it's very hard to do. We're all human beings. We have good days and bad days. Sometimes we forget things. So at least I know that I do. And so the concept here was to take these very precise protocols and automate them. So if you look at an eye chart versus eyes by 2020, eye chart has some qualitative characteristics that we'll talk about. You know, one, and again, you guys are the experts, you see this all the time. Children can peek at the eye chart, they can memorize the eye chart. Like I just talked about, it requires a lot of training and interpretation. It requires a certified or trained vision screeners to travel to the students. It's extraordinarily expensive. And the, the uh, idea of collecting data and reporting on the results is very labor uh, intensive. And, you know, it's inconsistent and prone to errors. So if we can automate all of these things, we end up with a very accurate, reliable, accessible, because it's software, when we're talking about ICE by 2020, it's affordable, and the data is automatically collected. So the performance of the system and the results, the vision screenings, are measurable. So I want to stop just briefly. Monica, has, has any questions come in or if, if you've not asked your questions at this point, I want to give you an opportunity to type your questions in, make sure that we uh, answer them. Uh, we haven't had any questions come in yet, but feel free to ask questions or to raise your hand if you would like us to know that you have a question for the end. Yeah, at, at, at any point in time, so please let us know. So I'm going to move on. So here's what we're going to talk about. When we talk about, obviously, we we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, vision. So go through some facts. We want to talk about age-appropriate vision screening. 
then we will talk more specifically about iSpy 2020 from a vision screening perspective. Then we'll talk about the data features and then very briefly point you in the direction of additional resources and, and provide you contact information so that you can continue to interact with us and get the information that you may need from us. So again, already talked about this, up to one in four children has a vision problem. And as educators and nurses, what is staggering is to think about the impact of these vision disorders on children because 80% of learning occurs visually. This is well understood, well documented. So if a child can't see, it makes it, ex well, let me say it this way. If a child can't see and nobody knows, it makes it very difficult for that child to learn. So common, common sense, but uh, when you realize how many children have vision problems, it's actually quite frightening. So the other thing about vision is that it really touches all facets of a child's life. And so it, it really does pose a significant risk to them educationally. Uh, it, it, it poses a risk to their health because certain vision problems can lead to monocular blindness. And it also poses a risk to them economically. Now, unfortunately, low-income children and children that are experiencing problems academically or behaviorally in school are disproportionately affected by vision problems. So there's even a greater need among the disadvantaged in, in our population. Um, there is a, uh, a visual process called eye teaming. It's, I won't get into the technical aspects of it, but about one in five children in school suffer from what is called eye teaming or other focusing problems that make it challenging for them to remain on task for extended periods of time. So as you can appreciate, these vision problems are often misdiagnosed or misinterpreted as uh, learning disability or attention-related problems or sometimes even uh, dyslexia. So what's interesting is how this translates into uh, uh, the lives of older children. So as you can appreciate, if you have problems seeing, you don't have glasses, your world's always been blurry, after school you're not very likely to go out and participate in activities that other children might, like riding a skateboard or a bicycle or playing kickball or doing the things that kids do, even hide and seek becomes challenging. And so there are studies that are now showing that, sh that these older children with vision disorders are at an increased re uh, risk for obesity. So this is what we were talking about earlier, uh, is that, you know, it, it touches all the, the various facets of a child's life and the, the impact is substantial. So that's why we're so passionate about addressing this major shortcoming, which the Healthy People 2010 study showed that there's been no change, no improvement in the detection of vision disorders. And we cannot help these children unless we know that they have a vision problem. So real quickly, in the chat box, if you could just let us know the state from which you are calling. Um, I know that it says the area of the country, but this isn't a poll. We just want to know what state you're calling in from. And that will help us talk about some of the um, uh, variations that may exist in vision screening laws from state to state. For example, Arizona is one of the few states that don't have any laws requiring uh, vision screening children, which is um, a shock to many, but there is no legislation that requires that. We have other states that actually do have some laws on the books. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. Um, if the legislation encumbers or restricts the type of vision screenings that can be performed, that can be problematic because as we're talking about, there's advancements in vision screening technology. The good news is that because iSpy, as you're about to see, is a visual acuity test, it is uh, accepted uh, as a valid vision screening in most states. 
So great. All right. So we've got we've got some neighbors here in Nevada and we've got our friends from South Carolina and New Jersey, so it's nice to see everyone um on board. Uh so here's here's another thing just to keep in mind is that there there are recommendations for medical organizations that are very specific about what is the appropriate method to vision screen children based on their age? So some of you may be familiar with uh, binocular autorefraction or what is sometimes called photo screening. These are instrument-based vision screenings. Um, and the recommendations say, look, you can, you can, if you have the resources, you can vision screen children from six months to three years of age using these instruments. It's an acceptable way to vision screen young children. However, um, once a child is school aged, it is, once a child's in school, it is very clear that visual acuity screening is the preferred method. Now, like Monica talked about, for many years, well over 100 years now, when you talked about visual acuity screening, that meant we had to use a wall chart. And there's a litany of problems with that. So that's why we're going to be talking now about iSpy 2020, which is a solution, an alternative to using the eye chart. So before I get into the detail about iSpy, I just want to show you that iSpy is literally just a video game that children play. Now I should mention there is no audio. Don't I don't think there's going to be any audio in this video, but I just want to show you what the what it looks like when a child's playing I Spy. That young man is sitting 10 feet away from the laptop. He's using a mouse and he's playing a game that looks very much like what you're seeing on the screen. And hopefully it's coming across fairly easily. It's really just a very simple matching game. And at the end of the game, the uh, report, the vision screening results automatically appear. I'm going to be talking about this in some detail, but for those of you that have never seen I Spy 2020 before, I just wanted to point out that it's a game. So I'm going to try and skip over this if I can. Okay, so um, for us to sit here and talk about uh, the accuracy of I Spy 2020 is fine, but what is important is what other people, independent scientific medical validation studies have found. And so in the great state of South Carolina, there is the Medical University of South Carolina. And within that university happens to be one of the top ophthalmic clinics in the entire world. They're called the Storm Eye Institute. They independently evaluated iSpy 2020. And what they found was that the results using an eye patch, which is occluding each eye, we're going to talk about this in more detail, that the results from iSpy were not significantly different than those of a professional examination. That's pretty impressive considering we're talking about a simple video game that doesn't require any certification, it requires virtually no training to use, and it automatically collects the data. And by the way, uh, for those of you that haven't uh, vision screened a child using iSpy yet, what you will see undoubtedly is that the children love it, and they very often ask to play it again, which is not something that I ever experienced when I was vision screening children using an, uh, a wall chart. So. Um, when you receive your supplies, for those of you that are going to be using iSpy in the near future, we're going to be uh, sending out supplies to you in the very near future. For each vision screening station, you will receive an extension cable. It's very important that you know that this 10-foot mouse extension cable is very useful when you're actually setting up the vision screening stations because you use that cable for, to uh, indicate or help you measure out where you should be placing the laptop relative to the students. So 10 feet is the testing distance, and in fact, we provide that cable that is exactly that distance. You will then plug one end of that cable into your laptop, the other end, uh, your mouse, 
the uh, mouse cable plugs into the other end. So there's actually slack in the cable uh, when you're testing. And again, we'll show you some pictures. You'll see that up close. There's some testing glasses that are red and blue in color. Those are used to test depth perception. We send out a set of left and right occluding glasses, again, to cover up each eye during the testing, which you'll see in just a couple minutes. Uh, a near stereo testing card, a LEO response panel. These are special situations, materials, uh, supplies that you would need, uh, depending on various testing situations. And the only thing that I point out here is that you don't have to worry about when you're going to use these particular materials because iSpy will tell you on the screen exactly when to use what. And I'm going to show that to you in just a second. And then you'll also get a quick start guide. So setting up the iSpy vision screening stations, really, really simple. And once you're actually using iSpy 2020, you're going to find that one person can actually vision screen two or three children simultaneously. Because other than putting in the child's information and pressing go, there isn't a whole lot of interaction between you and the child. There is some, but you'll see uh, very quickly that you can screen multiple children at the same time. And if you notice in this particular picture, the young lady on the right is a little bit older and she's actually being vision screened using different symbols or optotypes than the young man on the left side. And in fact, what I will do is just circle what I'm talking about. So these, op these are the optotypes to which I'm referring. And you'll see on the left-hand side, we're using letters. And on the right-hand side, that young man is using Leah symbols. Now, the good news is, is that iSpy 2020 does that for you automatically. It's not something that you need to worry about. It will, um, it will do that for you all on its own as far as choosing which optotypes to use based on the child's age. So these are some photos of, of what the vision screening process looks like. And I just want to point out again, here's the testing distance of 10 feet, that's supposed to be an arrow. I'm definitely not an artist, but each child is sitting 10 feet away from the laptop. That, let me see if I can show over here. This is that extension cable. I'm drawing over it, that white extension cable that I was talking about. So you can see that it doesn't create any uh, trip points because even that cable is 10 feet long and then the mouse cable is another four or five feet. So there's plenty of slack um, in the mouse cable. And so this is an overhead view. You have the laptop computers. You have a testing distance of 10 feet. You've got a table here. Here's the children that are currently being tested. And then these are children, I, I guess I would just say they're in queue. And this is actually very important because what happens is these children are watching these children play the game. So by the time you actually bring the next set of students up to the table to play I Spy, they already know what to do. They're, they're, they've, they've already got it figured out. They understand that it's a matching game and they're, they're, they're ready to go. So what I, what I always recommend is in schools, uh, you know, that you start with older children, you know, so say you're screening uh, K through five. I start with fifth grade and have, you know, at the end of the fifth grade, I, start, I bring in the fourth graders and they're watching the, the end of the fifth grade class. And I do that all the way down to kindergarten. So starting with the older kids and working your way backwards is uh, what I recommend doing from a pragmatic standpoint. Um, this is the front cover of the quick start guide that you will all be receiving, and it just goes through exactly what we're, you know, what we've been talking about. So, you know, it goes through step one, put the computers that have iSpy on a desk, make sure that they're plugged in. It shows you how to adjust the screen, position the children 10 feet away, connect the mouse, um, leave at least two feet of space between the children, just so that they're not 
flopping elbows or anything else. Um, then make sure that you take those supplies and have each vision screening station outfitted with the supplies that you need um, and turn on the computers and you're pretty much off to the races. So again, I'll be going through a little bit more detail as to what ICE by 2020 looks like, but this guide also includes some additional information. Uh, I, I feel like this, there's been a lot of information, so I just want to pause briefly and see if there's any questions before we start going into more of the detail about iSpy. Monica, have there been any questions that have come in? No, but um, go ahead and type in questions into the chat box. I, I wanted to point out from our last quick poll that we took that we have people joining us from all over the United States, and that's really exciting because I know that vision screening guidelines and um, the way that vision screenings are done differ greatly from school to school, but uh, also in our research and talking with nurses, we found that they differ from state to state as well. So if you're from another, we're based in Arizona, but if you're from another state and you have a, spe a specific question about I-5, go ahead and type it in there too as well. So we have um, people joining us from South Carolina, New Jersey, Nevada, and Arizona today. Thank you. Great. You okay, must be doing so, a good job, Rich, because there's no questions. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or everyone's asleep. I hope not. But, um, <laughs> we're, 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 I'm going to show you iSpy, a live demo of iSpy in just a second. But, but before I do, I just want to give you a preview of what I'll be doing. The, the, in order to use iSpy, this is the degree of training to which you need to provide your volunteers and your vision screeners. They just need to type in their name. Now, if your school wishes to uh, collect the student's ID, they would type that in there. And by the way, if the school, if your school wants to make sure that this is not optional, in other words, you want that optional thing to go away, just come down here and check this box that says require student ID, and then they will be forced to actually type in an ID. They won't be able to leave it blank. They'll type in the student's first name and last name, their date of birth. Now, when they're typing in names and date of birth, it automatically capitalizes uh, when they're typing in the date of birth. If, say, you put in December 9th, as soon as you put in 1-2, it will automatically put the slash in for you, which I'm going to show you. And then if, say, this child was born on the 9th, you would put in 0-9. You can see my penmanship isn't great. Um, you put in 09 and it'll automatically put in the slash. So it makes typing much faster because you don't have to worry about capitalization. It does that for you. And you don't have to type in the slashes. It does that for you. If you want to test the child's vision, you'll just, uh, color vision, you'll just check that box. We'll talk about special needs later if we have time. If you have questions about what this does, you'll just click on that blue button. And, or if you have and Rich, I wanted to ahead. point out that um, there was a question that came in, uh, can the screens be altered for intellectually disabled students? So ah, later on okay. when you address special needs, that would be probably a good opportunity yes. to discuss it. Yes, so special needs, uh, in answer to that question, uh, you would just, I'm sorry about that. I apparently don't know what I'm doing. Um, hold on. So you'll just check that box, special needs, and we'll talk about that. Uh, ethnicity is optional, but if you want to collect that information, uh, grade, uh, teacher's name, and by the way, this means it's a drop-down box, so you'll just click on that and select from a list on both of those. You'll just select gender, and then this is very important. It is very important to indicate whether or not the child is wearing their prescription glasses or contacts. Now, contacts should apply to older children, but sometimes uh, people will put young children in contacts, although it's not recommended. So you're going to not just, don't just look at the child and say, oh, they're not wearing glasses. Ask them specifically, you know, do you have contacts? If they're not wearing glasses, if they're wearing glasses, it's pretty obvious, okay? You just check wearing. But if they're not, then you're going to want to find out, are, there, are they wearing contacts? 
if they are check wearing, or have they forgot forgotten or lost or broken their glasses? This is really important for the school nurses. They need to know this information because when they're following up on these reports, they're going to want to know this child actually failed their vision screening, but they lost their glasses. So now we need to contact the parents and say, look, they failed their vision screening and they lost their glasses, so they need them. We, we need to do something about that. Um, at this point, you can just click the Begin Screening button and the screening will begin. I'm going to show this to you in more detail. And then in a few minutes, I'm going to be talking about some additional information over here. A couple things I want to point out. If you also want to collect near vision acuity, because remember, we're testing at a distance of 10 feet, and uh, there are going to be certain states that require collecting near visual acuity. So if, if you're required to do that, then just check this box and then do your near vision acuity, and you'll be uh, prompted to put the results into the computer. Um, if you want to collect exact visual acuity, or what is referred to as threshold visual acuity, you would check this box, and that's at distance. Okay, so these, this is at distance. This one is just a manual entry of your near, uh, near VA results. I could get into a whole topic about whether or not this is necessary, but the bottom line is if you're required to collect those results, then you can type them into iSpy. And um, Rich, does someone need to click that button every single time they vision screen a student, or do they click it at the beginning of the session and it, uh, and it stays? So, so that's a good question. So you would be required to do this um, every single time. Um, Actually, that, I'm not sure about this. I, I know with this one, you don't. If you set this one, uh, it, re it retains it. And this one, I would have to test that. I am not, actually, I'm not sure. Uh, but I can make that uh, stay checked for, uh, you know, for that particular school or, you know, make it remember that you want to use <coughs> collect in your v VA. So, I guess my answer is this. If it does not retain the result, I, I will make it do that, and the same with uh, this one. I know that this one does uh, keep this setting. So, and, um, and also, I wanted to point out something, too. Uh, yeah, if you check the color vision one. But um, <coughs> you were typing in the information, and so that our listeners that are on the line know that they can also have the option of uploading their school rosters into the iSpike program. So all of those fields that would normally, you'd have to type in the student's name and last name and ID number, that would all automatically be uploaded into the system and pre-filled into the screen. And so we'll talk about that more later, but then you know that the vision screening process is much faster. Yeah, it'll it'll save you if it takes you 60 seconds to type in all of this information. Um, you'll save some time by just clicking this button over here, and a list of all the students pops up, and you select the student. And then when you do that, the only thing you have to complete is this question down here, because all of this has already been filled in for you. So it does save you time, for sure. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, when, once you begin the vision screening process, this is an example of one of the screens that pops up. So even if you've never done a vision screening using iSpy before, or even if you've never done a vision screening, all you have to do is follow the exact instructions that are provided on the screen at any particular time. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Um, I pointed out the uh, optotypes earlier. And what is really important to understand here is that this optotype at the bottom of the screen is randomized. So you can have children playing side by side and there's no opportunity for them to memorize or cheat off of the other child. Um, and we won't get into all the uh, technical aspects here except to say that what you will see is as the child plays the game, 
this shape will get smaller and smaller uh, automatically. So you don't, have, and sometimes it'll get bigger automatically too. So it's making all of the decisions uh, based on the child's responses in real time. And uh, so even if you've never vision screened, it's following the prescribed protocol exactly. Um, during the vision screening process, there's cartoon animations. So that really engage, psychosocially engages the child. So they're less likely to be distracted during the vision screening process. Here's an example of where we have vision screened both eyes open and now it's time to occlude each eye uh, individually because not only do we test binocular but we also test monocularly which is important for the detection of certain vision disorders like amblyopia and eye alignment issues as well which we'll talk about next which is uh, we also look if you've checked the color vision uh, box we look for red color which is the uh, red green color deficiency which is the most common form of color blindness it affects about one out of every maybe 20 males and it affects about one out of every 200 females um, so there is some discussion as to whether or not you need to color vision test at all but if you want to color vision test, you can do that with Eyes by 2020. It is a condition that's not treatable, but uh, very often educators want to know whether or not a child can perceive color. So that's built into Eyes by 2020. And whether or not you've tested color vision, the next part of the test will be depth perception. And this is an image, it's called a random dot stereogram. It's, it's using the same matching motif, so the children are still very familiar with the idea that you see something here and you've got to match it down here. They move the mouse left and right, you'll see that in just a second. And this is an image that you can only see under certain conditions. You need to be wearing the red-blue glasses and you need to have the straight eyes, you can't have crossed eyes, and you need to have the neurological and cognitive uh, vision uh, center of your brain needs to all be working and intact. So we only test this based on the child's age and whether or not we know that they've got good visual acuity. If they've got good visual acuity, then this is where we test the alignment of the eyes as well as the neurological processing of the vision data. So if they had something like eye suppression, or uh, another uh, vision process was failing that we would not normally see, you, this test will pick it up. So this is all built into iSpy, and then regardless of whether or not the child has quote unquote passed iSpy, they, uh, they win. Every child wins. And in this particular case, this uh, child won uh, discovering a pony. So again, this is all cartoon animations. So before I do the live demo, and other than the one question that we've already received, are there any questions at this point? Because I'd like to show you iSpy in real life now. Okay, so this is iSpy. I'm going to type, I'm going to do exactly what I was talking about. I'm just going to type in, I'm going to press you can't see what letters I'm pressing. I am not capitalizing, so I am literally just typing in J-O-H-N and it's capitalizing for me. Again, I'm going to put in a birthday of uh, November, and as soon as I hit the second uh, uh, numeral, it put the slash in for me. I'm going to put in 05, and I'm going to put in um, 09 for 2009, and as soon as I go to click this, you'll see that it filled in it filled in the date of birth for me. Um, I won't select ethnicity. I'm going to say that this child's in kindergarten. Teacher's name is Apples. And, and by the way, sometimes they put in. Um, it's entirely up to you how you use this field. If you notice, it says teacher name slash homeroom. So that's why I put in apples, because maybe the name of the homeroom is the apples homeroom. Um, I'm going to say that the child's not wearing glasses. And 
Uh, all I'm going to do is hit begin string. I'm not going to input near VA results. Actually, I'm going to do that because some of you may want to see what that is, so I'm going to do that. I'm not going to acquire an exact VA. That takes a little bit longer, not much longer, but I just want to use a, a cr critical line testing, which is a perfectly acceptable way of vision screening children. So that is the extent of the training that is required. As Monica pointed out earlier, if you wanted to, you, I, I could select uh, if I had students preloaded into my roster, I would select that button, and then these children are children that have been entered into my school. I could just click on this young man, okay, and he's not wearing glasses. See how it populated all of this data for me? So it makes selecting a child m a much faster process. One of the other things I should point out real quickly is that if I wanted to sort, in other words, I'm just looking, let's say I'm just looking for uh, first graders, I just typed in the letter one. Um, look, I know that the child's last name starts with the letter S, so I typed an S in here. So it helps me uh, very quickly identify a particular child. I hope that's helpful. So what I'm going to do now is, just changes child's information. Just uh, okay. So if you notice, because I've checked the box that says I checked the box that said input near VA results. So I don't know if you can see these uh, instructions, but it basically says that. Uh, to, to do your near visual acuity testing following whatever protocol it is that you do and then type in the results. So I'm just going to say that this child near visual acuity was 2030. If I put in, just to let you know, if I put in an incorrect result here, uh, let's say I put in 2034, that's not a valid, that's not a valid uh, near visual acuity value, it knows what our acceptable logmar, what are referred to as logmar, or Snellen values for visual acuity. So it does error checking to make sure that you're that you did not inadvertently mistype the information. It'll ask you to verify that that information is correct. Now you're going to start the vision screening process. So if I did not check that button that dialog box would not have popped up and the first thing that would, that would have popped up is this. Make sure that the student is not wearing an eye patch. I press enter and at this point uh, the very first thing that the child does is pick the character that they wish to play. Once they click the left mouse button the game just automatically proceeds and I won't spend time going through this whole thing but hopefully um, there's, it's consistent with what you just saw, and that is that it's a matching game, and the shape at the bottom of the screen is randomized, so sometimes it will repeat, sometimes it will uh, be different. Every, every single test will be different. At this point during the test, we're just verifying that the child understands that it's a matching game, and then you'll start to see that the shape at the bottom of the screen is going to begin to get smaller. So that's now down to what is referred to as critical line. And again, I won't go through the whole thing. I just want to show you that once we know that the child understands it's a matching game, then you will get uh, instructions to patch a child's left eye, right eye, put on colored glasses. It'll take you through every step of the process. I'm going to stop the test right now. I, the way that I stopped the test, just to let you know, was by pressing the space bar. So, Monica, again, interrupt me if there's any questions um, along the way, okay? That's good. So, in a few minutes, I'm going to go back and I'm going to show you the data reporting aspect of this, but just visually, so I'm going to be clicking on the reports button and going through that, but I just want to talk about what happens. The, the, at any point in time, from any computer on which 
you have iSpy 2020 installed, you can access any of the vision screening reports, regardless of what computer the vision screening was conducted on. So if, if, if the nurse in the school has iSpy on his or her computer in their office, and out in the field, in the cafeteria, or wherever, the library, wherever the vision screenings are being conducted, the vision, the, the vision screenings that are being conducted on those computers out in the school are available to the nurse on his or her computer in their office. Um, because all of the data is maintained in a HIPAA compliant centralized repository. So you can, with the click of a button, which I'm going to show you, you can pull up a report, and if you press the S key, which is down here, it says press the S key, it will translate this report into Spanish for you with the click of a button. Uh, so here's what happens. You have iSpy on the computer. You can get customized summary reports, which are very helpful rather than uh, having to look at each individual report. You know, the, the thought process here is that this information is for the school, this information is for the parents, and this information, which is your ability to output it into Microsoft Excel, might be something that either the IT departments might be interested in doing or some other, this, this allows you to do really a, a, a detailed analysis of the results. So this is, you know, a summary report. This is every single detail about every single student. And what's important is that only you, this is protected data, so only you have access to your data, but you have it available 24-7. And then the other aspect of this is that you can export this uh, information to other databases. When the data resides here, it is HIPAA compliant. As soon as you dump it out into, you know, you export it into Excel or you print out a, a printed report of any type, then you become responsible for HIPAA compliance. So long as it's only on the computer or in the database, if it's on your screen or in the database, then it's, you know, HIPAA compliant. But uh, just be aware that, as I'm sure you all are, that there's that's a sensitive subject as far as protecting children's information, health information in particular. So I want to I want to do exactly what we uh, had just discussed, and that is I just want to show you the reports a little uh, very briefly because I want to make sure that we leave plenty of time for questions, and I've already been chatting with you for an hour. So what I'm going to do is I want to look at reports. Uh, over the last month. So I'm going to pull up some reports. Hopefully I've done some vision screen. This is just a sample. Uh, so I'm going to expand the data range a little bit so that you can get a feeling for what it looks like when you're managing uh, larger amounts of data. And by the way, the, the um, this uh, a particular installation of iSpy 2020 is not related to any school. So this is just for fun. You know, these are just different tests and stuff. So it's, it's a, um, you're, you're not seeing, it, it will look much cleaner. Let me go back and explain what I'm talking about. See how there's children's names missing here and, and sometimes a proctor name isn't listed. This is where we do all of our testing. So, um, that's why you're you're seeing missing fields and stuff on your database. It wouldn't look like that at all. So here is what a report looks like if a child fails the vision screening. And there's a couple things that I want to point out. Here's the information about the vision screening process. So they passed visual acuity with both eyes. They're each eye individually, color vision, but they failed stereo. So this child, it is recommended that this child be seen by an eye care professional if they're not already under the care of an eye doctor. And there is a section on the report 
here where it says I professional use only that we encourage the doctors to fill that out and send it back to the school so that you have information about that particular child you know do they need glasses were they prescribed if you know is is there an, an impact in the classroom that you should be aware of so we try to make this as helpful as possible and by the way again if I press the S as in Spanish key you can see that it's uh, translated and it's translated into real Spanish it's not like a Google translation it's 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 hand translation into Spanish I'm going to press the E key to bring it back and if I want to print the report I can I'm going to go back here because I want to show you a couple of things if you wanted to print all before I show printing I, I want to show you how to filter uh, the information. So if I want to look at just the children that did not pass the vision screening, then I'm going to uncheck that box that says pass, and now my list of children are just those that failed. Now I just want to look at, say, first grade. So these are all the kids in first grade that failed. Let me get that off the screen if I can. I don't know how to do that. Hang on, bear with me for just a second, sorry. Um, so these are the children in first grade. If you wanted to further refine this list by uh, the particular proctor, for example. But anyway, um, so you have the ability to filter this list all the way down. Uh, and... I'm going to just clear these filters, and then what I want to show you is that you, at, once you've got your list defined, then you can print all the reports at once. You can print a summary report, or you can export that data into Excel, like I talked about earlier. So those are the buttons that I'm highlighting down there. That's the export into Excel. This will allow you to print all the reports at once, and this is a summary report that we talked about earlier. So there's lots of flexibility in the system, but the most important thing to keep in mind is that you never lose your data. So if I wanted to look at a student from years ago, you have the ability to just find that, find that particular student, click on them, and there's the vision screening report from however long ago it was. Um, there's a lot of features in here uh, that are possible, but we also try to make it really as simple to use as possible. There's something here um, that I'd like to point out, and that is this feedback button. And one of the things that we really appreciate is feedback from you, because you very quickly become the true experts on iSpy 2020. So if you have suggestions, then you click on that box and you start typing away until your heart's content. And what's very important for you to know is that we honestly do not know who you are. This is anonymous at this point. If you want us to know who you are, you absolutely need to put down your name and your phone number because we have no idea, we cannot get in contact with you otherwise. Now, the reason why we make this anonymous is because you might, these words up here might not be particularly friendly. So you don't have to be nice. We want to know your honest feedback and suggestions. So you type in whatever you need to type in, but please remember, if you want us to get in touch with you, then uh, let us know, hey, you know, this is, this is how you find me. You know, if you don't want to be uh, called on the phone, <clears throat> you know, leave us your email address, <clears throat> excuse me, or however you would prefer for us to get in touch with you. <clears throat> so that feedback button is a great way to get in touch with us if you're so inclined. And <clears throat> that is the database and reporting features. We're almost done. You know, this was, like I said, I, there's a lot of information here and obviously a lot of detail about ICE by 2020, like 
how do you import your student roster or how do you export your data into your student health information system? Or <clears throat> I've got a parent that wants some additional information. Where do I find that? And so <clears throat> the answer to that is iSpy2020.com. And on there, you will find you can download and print your own quick start guide or some general information. There is a complete user guide available for those of you that want to know every little detail, uh, which we encourage, of course. Um, if you've got parents that are looking for some statistics about vision, information about vision, we've got that. We provide you with a near stereo card and a response panel and the kits that we send you, but if you're missing those, you wouldn't be missing them from us, but if they got lost and you, in a pinch, needed to print them, reprint them, you could do that here. The pre-implementation survey, which most of you or all of you already filled out, um, you can find that here. If you wanted to sign up for training, so for example, let's say that you've got a bunch of volunteers that you're going to have. You can send them to the by 2020 and say, hey, I want you to attend the next webinar, and they could sign up for the webinar by clicking here. And then for <clears throat> the IT people, that box is where you click to download iSpy, and you can install iSpy on as many computers as you want. There's no limitation. So your license and the instructions that we provide you, you're given a unique activation code that's just for your school or your school district or your organization, and you can put it on as many computers as you want, no limitations, and you can perform as many vision screenings as you want without limitations. So. Uh, you have unlimited access to ISPY 2020. Uh, you have unlimited email support. You have unlimited access to these training sessions if for some reason you wanted to try and, and attend another one. That's absolutely acceptable. We'll talk to you on the phone for up to an hour. And we do, very rarely do we ever have to do that, but if it's required, um, we can shortly chat with you on the phone if you're having specific issues. The other thing that we can do here is we can also remotely access your computer with your permission. So in rare instances, the IT departments of certain organizations say, look, we really have uh, a challenge here, whatever it might be. It might be a firewall issue or something technical. Uh, we can get on these computers remotely and help you, even knowing it's your computer. Um, you would be sitting in front of the computer, you'd see everything that we're doing, we'd just be there to, to help out as, as much as we can. And with that, this adorable little girl who's one of, she's a uh, young lady that we vision screened, uh, I think it was last year, and she just left a, a huge impression on all of us. She was just, she, you know, every time I see this photo, I'm just reminded that she is the reason why Vision Quest 2020 is so committed to supporting you and your efforts because you've got thousands of these adorable little creatures that, you know, we are so honored to um, have an impact and on them and, and hopefully make your lives easier because that's really what we're trying to do is support your efforts in supporting her and, and all the students that you guys are so dedicated to. So with that, I'm more than happy to answer any questions, but at this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Monica, who will talk about how to get in touch with us and, and take your questions. And thank you again thank for attending. Yes, thank you. And on the screen, you'll see there's contact information. So if you have additional questions after the webinar that you think of, because sometimes that happens, and you can email me at mhecker at visionquest2020.org or Richard Cherendi, who is our presenter today. You can email him directly. You can also download materials at ispy2020.com. And at the end of this session, you're going to receive an email with a link to a recording of today's live webinar training. And that way you can review it, share it with any of your volunteers, 
And also, if you just simply want to um, go over it again to refresh your, your knowledge of the program. We also have a survey on iSpy2020.com, so if you have not had a chance to take that survey, it would be great for us to gather some of that information that helps us to better serve children and schools in our community. So if anyone has any other questions, go ahead and type them in now. And I think we had the, the one question about can the screens be altered for um, intellectually disabled students. I wanted to make sure that that question gets answered. And um, yeah, that actually, mm -hmm. you want to go ahead and yeah, answer that? I, yeah, well, I responded to Vicki privately, but what oh. I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to, well, it's appropriate that the entire audience be aware of the response. So, um, uh, I'm going to chat back to everyone. There's a couple questions that came in. So one is, um, you know, the the special needs mode. What it does is it allows you to essentially play the game on behalf of the student. So what you do is you give them that Leo response panel, and then you ask them to simply point to the shape that they see on the screen, and then you are in control of the mouse. So uh, we also find that um, we do vision screenings at the Special Olympics every year, and children that cannot participate in a traditional wall chart vision screening are actually able to play Ice by 2020, not in special needs mode, I mean just normal mode where they play themselves because of how it engages them. So uh, another question that came in was how long does screening last per student? It's, it, it varies. Ironically, children with good vision take longer to screen than children that have horrible vision. So some screenings will only last a minute while other screenings may go as long as three minutes or four minutes. Um, but that does not include selecting the child from a drop-down list or typing the information. So what we always do for ultra-conservative estimates is, and I'm going to type this into the chat, is we say 10 students per hour per laptop. So if you want to screen 200 students and you set up four laptops, then 4 times 10 is 40, times 5 is you know, 5 hours uh, is 200 students. So 10 students per hour per laptop is, about, and, that, and most, by the way, you'll see that you can screen more than 10 students per hour, but that's just an ultra-conservative estimate. Um, I wanted to add to that, too. On the screen that we showed the setup, the map of how to set up the students, that particular school, there was a school that provided to us the setup that they were using. We went out and took a look at it and watched the vision screen take place. And they had two computers together on three tables, so they had set up six sessions, six, um, sorry, computers, which is great because with the license, you can download it on as many computers that you would like to essentially setting up another vision screening device. And what they told me and provided the information to us and what we witnessed too is that they actually ask for about 30 minutes for each, um, each class. And that allows time for the class to come in, to sit down, to get their name chosen on the computer, to do the vision screening. It's the whole, the whole process. So it's very fast when you get more than one vision screening device going at the same time. I, there was another question from, from uh, Sarah, and, and Sarah's been using iSpy for, for quite some time. Thankfully, she is, um, she's just been a, a huge advocate. And interestingly enough, um, she has got a uh, request because 30% 30 of her students um, speak uh, Creole French. So 
the question came up, are other translations possible? I think you guys can actually see all of the questions that are coming through, but maybe not. Anyway, bottom line is for those of you that are interested in translations, here is the reality of the situation. Yes, translation into other languages is possible, and we'd love to do that. Um, the issue is is that there's engineering costs that are involved, not just the, the human translation expense, which perhaps individual schools or organizations that have a specific need would be willing to participate in and, and help us with. That would be great. But uh, the, the, so aside from the actual translation, then there's engineering costs involved. But we will work with organizations in every way possible to meet your needs and to make your life easier because we want you guys to go and become huge advocates for this and to spread the word and and uh, the, the more that I spy 2020 meets your needs the more likely that is to happen so we're open to the conversation but we would need to identify donations or grants to cover some of the engineering costs involved okay are there any other questions Okay, terrific. So wow. I'd like to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would like for everyone to know that they will be receiving an email with the recording of the webinar and also to make sure that you just fill out that survey if you haven't had a chance. And on behalf of Richard Sherendi and Vision Quest 2020 and myself, I'd like to thank you for joining us and taking the time to learn more about iSpy 2020 and to learn how to use it in your school. And uh, my name is Monica Hecker, and you can always email me at mhecker at visionquest2020.org with any questions. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.